On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA's billion-dollar plan for deorbiting the International Space Station, Axiom Space unveils their new Artemis moon suit design, and astronomers looking over decades-old telemetry catch an active volcano on Venus. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get into it. This is The Space Race. 2030 is quickly approaching, and NASA has begun their planning process for the mission that will deorbit the International Space Station, capping off the decade with a fiery retirement for one of humanity's greatest achievements. The news comes from some additional details released by NASA on March 13th, which showed that their 2024 budget proposal included a request for $180 million, a price that NASA says will give them a healthy start for the project. While previously the plan was to use attached cargo spacecraft like Russia's Progress Vehicle to slowly maneuver the station into a decaying orbit, the agency has decided that deorbiting something as large as the ISS requires more control and has opted for building an orbital tug to push the ISS into a trajectory that ends over the South Pacific. Kathy Luters, NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Operations, said the agency has calculated that this plan would cost just short of $1 billion, but that's not where they want to end it. She explained that NASA would rather get that cost down by seeking outside help with a request for proposals. NASA has been making great use of commercial agencies over the last couple of years, and a quick glance to the future shows that they are not planning on slowing down anytime soon. So it isn't strange at all that NASA's budgetary plans for this big of an operation would include driving the cost down by hiring a commercial company to manage it. NASA is always looking for redundancy, Luter said while discussing the plans, and you can see that not just with their plans to use commercial partners for the ISS orbit, but also with the station's replacements. Because we're not going to be getting rid of what was, for a long time, humanity's only long-duration habitat in space without putting more stations, specifically more advanced space stations, into orbit to replace it. Right now, most of the hype is for NASA's Lunar Gateway Station. This pivotal habitat will be assembled in a near-rectilinear halo orbit around the moon, an orbit which will ensure near-constant communication with Earth. The gateway will be made up of modules from public and private partners from around the world and will not only give us a stable platform to study our moon over the long term, but will provide our exploratory missions with a crucial jumping off point to refuel and set off towards Mars and the outer solar system. Gateway will be starting its mission in late 2024 if all goes well, but it's hardly the only government-run station that is planned. Russia's Roscosmos is planning on starting their own station in 2027. The Russian Orbital Service Station will be the Russians' first station since the Mir deorbited in 2011. Plans for the Mir 2 were transformed into the International Space Station later. Ross will be orbiting way up at the 400-kilometer range in a sun-synchronous orbit, so it can monitor the entire surface of the Earth. They're also planning their own lunar orbital station, but the designs are as old as 2007, and there hasn't been much more work done on it since. No news yet on how far along these station plans are, but with Russia most likely pulling out of the International Space Station program in 2024, it's a good bet that they'll push hard to get their own station up so they'll not be left behind. And speaking of not being left behind, we have China's Tiangong Station. China was shut out of the International Space Station program, so they just decided to make their own, and did so in spectacular fashion. The station is currently complete to the baseline China had planned for, and more modules are going up soon to join the three already in orbit. The whole station came together in just under two years, which is an outstanding pace to set. Adding to that, the Chinese agency has repeatedly pledged to allow other countries to use their station, a classy bit of generosity considering they were shuttered previously. And finally, the Indian Space Research Organization is planning on putting a smaller station for themselves in about 2035. Plans for the station had to be pushed back due to some complications regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, but the Indian agency has been wanting to get a station up since they proposed it back in 2019. Then we have the many, many stations proposed by commercial companies. The biggest and most well-funded, which are Starlab, Axiom Station, and the Orbital Reef. 
Starlab is a project designed by Voyager Space's NanoRacks company Lockheed Martin and Airbus. Axiom Station is designed by Axiom Space and is planned to be a module for the ISS before breaking off and forming its own space station before the ISS end of life date. And Blue Origin's Orbital Reef is planned to pull together most of billionaire Jeff Bezos's companies, along with Boeing, Sierra Space, and a couple of others, to create a large space tourism hub and laboratory. And there are plenty of other stations planned, of course, but the scope of work we're looking at here is tremendous. By 2040, humanity will have gone from only one semi-permanent orbiting habitat to many. We are going to explode into the cislunar space at a speed that will likely be talked about for centuries. The ISS blazing into the South Pacific will mark the end of an era and the true beginning of our new space race. On March 15th, Axiom Space unveiled the brand new spacesuit that will be worn by Artemis III astronauts on their return to the lunar surface this decade. This is NASA's first new spacesuit design since the EVA suit created for the Space Shuttle program, and those are still used to service the ISS to this day. Axiom was awarded the $228 million contract to design a new suit back in September of 2022. This came after the catastrophic failure of NASA's original Artemis spacesuit plan that suffered from extreme cost overruns and a significantly delayed production schedule. If we compare the NASA suit from 2019 with the Axiom suit in 2023, I think we can agree that this was all for the best. The suit shown off in the conference last week definitely looked more flexible than any spacesuit we've seen before, including the old Apollo-era lunar suits, even if Buddy did require a walking stick to help keep him upright. Remember, these suits are made for the moon's gravity, which is one-sixth that of Earth's, so the balance is going to be a little off for walking around a stage. You should probably disregard the stylish black covering too. While it was created by Esther Marquis, the costume designer on the Apple Plus show For All Mankind, this covering is a stand-in to cover up internal components for the unveiling. Black coverings would dangerously increase the amount of heat absorption on the moon, and Axiom pointed out that the black portions of this design will be white by the time that they hit that dusty lunar surface. The helmet features a light bar to help the astronauts see in those shadowy craters, and is also equipped with an HD camera for live-streaming POV footage back to Earth. The new gloves are built for maximum dexterity and ease of movement, so that astronauts don't get hand cramps while working on the moon, and the ingress and egress from the suit is made easy by a back hatch design, so they jump in feet first, shimmy their arms and head into place, and then close up the back and they are good to go. The show model was meant to debut the main new features of these suits, mobility. Our demonstration astronaut was able to pull off a bunch of squats and lunges in his new spacesuit with relative ease. He could even crouch down to touch the floor and then stand back up with a little help from his stick. Getting around in even the ISS era gear is reportedly a pain, and that's before we account for the problems that have begun to show themselves with age like the leaks and condensation buildup in the station's EMUs last year, which halted spacewalk operations for most of that year. The moon is a challenging place to design for, along with the usual features needed for a spacesuit, things like pressurization, carbon dioxide removal, waste management. This new suit has to hold up to increased solar and cosmic radiation, temperatures that fluctuate from dangerously high to incredibly low, and even the possibility of micrometeoroid impacts. The biggest challenge is actually going to be thermal regulation. The first use for these suits will be on Artemis 3, which will be a landing at the lunar south pole in 2025 or so. Most of the cratered landscape there is perpetually in shadow and will be extremely cold. In some places, it can reach minus 253 degrees Celsius. Axiom specifically designed the boots of their new spacesuit to keep astronauts' feet warm as they trudge through the icy regolith. NASA has actually put out two contracts for suits, one to Axiom for the new lunar get-ups and one to Collins Aerospace for gear that will replace the aging space station units, because these two are different applications and it makes sense to need two different suits. But so far, Axiom suits look promising and we can imagine astronauts will be very happy to get this upgrade for Artemis 3. 
Planetary scientists have made a new discovery on Venus using 32-year-old data. On March 15th, during the 54th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, Robert Herrick from the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute presented the findings of his team, a large and recent volcanic eruption on the surface of Venus. While studying the data from NASA's Magellan probe, the researchers were able to make out changes to some vent systems on Mott Mons, one of Venus's largest volcanoes. The photos taken in 1991 are eight months apart and show clear changes to a volcanic vent and maybe some new flow patterns. Scientists had already found a wealth of volcanic evidence before, but nothing recent and certainly nothing as close to being caught live as this. Planets like Mars also have evidence of volcanic activity in the past, but whereas researchers are more or less sure that Mars's days of lava flows are behind it, they weren't so confident about Venus until now, of course. The bigger question, though, is why wasn't this caught 32 years ago? Well, that's mostly down to a difference in mission. Magellan wasn't sent to Venus to look for evidence of volcanology, it was snapping pictures for the purposes of mapping the Venusian surface. Adding to that, the atmosphere on our sister planet is so dense, the pressure so high, that an eruption would be smaller and much harder to catch, even though NASA has identified many volcanoes on the surface. So when the data was finally distributed to researchers in different fields like geology, a couple of years had gone by, and more would go by while they searched the enormous amount of image data. However, now that they've had a look, Herrick says there's no question that these images show active volcanism, even though the images were taken at different times and from different angles. He says, quote, We really wanted to nail down that the difference we saw in the vent could not possibly in any way be a factor of simply looking at the same feature from different angles. And there's a reason that this is so exciting. Not only is Venus much closer than other targets for volcanic surveys in our solar system, like Saturn's moon Enceladus and Titan, but we are sending three missions to Venus in the near future. NASA is sending Da Vinci Plus and Veritas to take atmospheric samples and send back some updated information on the planet, while the European Space Agency is sending Envision to help out that study. This doesn't mean we won't be visiting worlds like Titan, of course. Dragonfly is still being prepped for that. It just means that we have some hope that a planet much closer to us might hold some amazing insights, and that, like Mars, Venus could become a hub for scientific discovery for the new space race. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real, and subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week, and if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.